It's Wednesday, July 21st, and time for your Barbados Today evening news update. No lockdown is on the horizon, assures Health and Wellness Minister Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey Bostick. Over the past two weeks, COVID-19 cases have been in the double digits and authorities have raised concerns about the growing clusters. But Minister Bostick, who received a donation of laptops for the immunization department, told reporters despite the spike, authorities are ramping up action to control the spread and there is no need for a lockdown. We are nowhere near a lockdown. Lockdown is the last resort and we will gradually, and we have started that obviously with the curfew and other things, to increase our um, public health interventions and non-public health interventions, sorry, non-pharmaceutical interventions that we have been introducing like the curfew and the limitation on numbers and so on. The numbers you are seeing, and we discussed this in the EOC, if you start with 40 positives on one day, we anticipate a certain number of cases as a result of that. Why? Because we've been doing aggressive contact tracing and we've been testing large numbers. For the last several days, the numbers would have been close to or surpassing 1,000. So yes, we anticipated that we would get cases and that's not an issue. Uh, we are seeing one or two cases coming up that are not connected to the major clusters and that is concern for us. It means that we have a bit more work to do. But at this point in time, we are not contemplating a lockdown. The health minister again urged citizens to adhere to the protocols as he expressed concern that some people were not coming forward for testing. We are nowhere, as far as I'm concerned, near where we want to be. And that's the gospel truth. And it is something that we will continue to push we will do everything possible. We've been trying different ways and means of doing so. Uh, we were hoping that with the cases that we have at the moment, that people would at least recognize that the virus is still very present in Barbados, as we always felt, even though the numbers were low because of the nature of the cases that we are seeing presenting to the accident and emergency. And we've had some people who, by the time they came forward, they were sick, and in some cases very sick. So we always knew that somewhere out there there were cases and there were people not coming forward. But uh, there's still a long way to go in getting people back to where we were before in relation to observing the protocols. Despite Minister Bostick's assurances, the Democratic Labour Party says the spike in cases is worrying and the President Verla de Pisa is calling on the government to outline a comprehensive plan. By any index, this is alarming and a cause for concern, especially as we welcome visitors to these shores while still grappling with community spread and a seriously low uptake of the vaccine. Clearly, a two-week part-time curfew meant nothing to the spread of the virus. If the decision is that we tough it out, tell us outright. If it is that we need to reintroduce harsher measures, say that too. This is not the time to be silent, but to speak up firmly. This is a time when the country needs strong leadership and definitive policy articulation, no matter how unpopular the decision might be. Meanwhile, the island has recorded 10 new COVID cases and 165 people are in isolation. The positives include 5 females and 5 males from the 1,288 tests conducted by the Bastos Santos Public Health Laboratory on Tuesday. Barbados has recorded 4,032 cases of COVID-19. 48 people have succumbed to the virus. To date, 2,400,518 2400,4, tests have been conducted by the Public Health Laboratory. The National Vaccination Program for COVID-19 has seen 98,450 people receive first doses of the vaccine, while a total of 73,621 persons have been given the second doses. Those who are fully vaccinated represent 27.2% of the population.
In other news, government's welcome stamp program has earned the country over $8 million in revenue. Tourism Minister Senator Lisa Cummings delivered an upbeat report on the program's performance as she led off debate on the remote employment bill in the upper chamber today. Senator Cummings said 4,800 people have weathered out the pandemic on the island. She said many of the nomads of the program have expressed an interest in staying even longer, and it's paying off. Despite a pandemic continuing and surges and lockdowns, that despite having to deal with ash outside of their homes and restrictions sometimes on their movement, and despite living through a hurricane here with us, they want to extend their stay here in Barbados beyond this first year. Their stay expires on the 30th of this month, Mr. President, and they want to be in a position to say to their families that their children can enroll in school when the September term begins. They want to be able to have their leases on their houses extended for an additional year because the legislation has facilitated that. And so when we talk, Mr. President, about these people who have come, seen, stayed, and are embracing us, Mr. President, I think the question has to be asked first and foremost, is this an opportunity for us to go even further with the welcome stamp? And certainly from the Ministry of Tourism's perspective and from my own perspective as Minister with Responsibility for Tourism, it absolutely is. Senator Cummins also provided an update on plans for the Grand Yadams International Airport Public-Private Partnership during debate on the Gaia Transfer of Management and Vesting of Asset Bill. She said the government is now considering 13 bits. The government of Barbados is committed to ensuring the protection of labour at the Grand Yadams International Airport. And despite a significant reduction, and I don't want to call it an insignificant reduction because I don't think that certainly those of us who are numerically inclined would think that 95% of revenue year to date would be an insignificant number. What the Grand Island International Airport has been able to do, Mr. President, in the last year has been nothing short of commendable. With 95% of its revenue year to date gone, the Grand Yacht International Airport has still retained its labor force, as is the standard across the public sector. And it is on that basis that the government of Barbados has had from central government to transfer funds to support the Grand Yacht International Airport and to ensure that they could meet their operating costs. This is a commitment of the government of Barbados, and it will continue to be a commitment of the government of Barbados. The PPP is, however, not sitting well with opposition Senator Caswell Franklin, who expressed concern about how workers could be affected. So, if you want to protect labor, I challenge you to. Because it has not happened so far. Hospital, Grand Island International Airport, you name it. Workers' rights were not protected. They tell me, when they see me, at the hospital in particular, i so sorry I listen to you. Because there's a hell hole up there when it comes to employment practices. So I hope, as you said, that you're going to be protecting labor, because it has not happened so far. And quite frankly, this government is not known for protecting labor. You're known for protecting a certain any. He also questioned if local experts could not be trusted to manage the country's sole airport. Why are we doing this? Are our people so... Um, we said them. Like we can't handle our own... Can't run the airport. They give me a six-month course, then let me go and learn. You can get with it. Sorry, sir. You're going to transfer the thing for 30, how many, 30 years? No. If you think that we need to have... Something like what you're planning and all the the um you know, the, the, the services that you want to provide and, and we don't know how to do them. There's something called training. There's regional and international news after this short break.
Barbados Today, news you can trust. To regional news now, UNICEF has voiced support for the strong hints from the Jamaican government that it could introduce legislation to ban corporal punishment. On Tuesday, Prime Minister Andrew Holness lamented the recent death of a four-year-old boy allegedly at the hands of his father, insisted that violence should not be tolerated. The death of a four-year-old boy, Nashawn Brown, has saddened the nation. Now, the way in which parents discipline children is again up for debate. In a statement on Wednesday, UNICEF recommended that the government move to make corporal punishment illegal in schools and homes. The agency said findings from the Multiple Indicator Cluster Survey, MICS 2011, indicate that 7 out of 10 Jamaican children under age 15 are subjected to violent punishment at home. It also shows that children between the ages of two and four are more violently punished than older children, and children from poor families are almost five times as likely than those in wealthy families to suffer severe physical punishment. More boys are violently punished than girls, and more children in the Kingston metropolitan area are violently punished than children in rural areas. And according to data from the Jamaica Survey of Living Conditions 2018, 67% of children ages zero to eight Eight are being slapped and 18% beaten with an implement. UNICEF Jamaica representative Mariko Kagoshima said discipline is necessary for children, but it should not cause harm and it should never be a death sentence. On the international scene, massive flooding has left terrifying scenes in China's central Henan province, where at least a dozen were killed in the subway line that was flooded. Flora Bradley Watson of Reuters TV reports. Large swathes of China's central Henan province were underwater on Wednesday, following days of torrential rain. In the capital, Zhangzhou, at least 12 people were killed when a subway line was flooded. Videos show commuters chest deep in murky floodwaters and an underground station turned into a large churning pool. More than 500 people were pulled to safety. This man was one of them. The flood was so strong and many people were carried away by that. The remaining few of us, including a kid, were so tired and we nearly gave up. We kept holding on tight to the railing. That's why you can see many bruises on my arms. These are all the bruises. This is one too. This included too. If you don't hold on tight to the railing, it's very easy to be washed away. The flooding has inundated much of the city and the surrounding area. Henan is a major logistics hub in central China and has a population of around 100 million. Since the weekend, millions of lives there have been upended as trains have been suspended, highways closed and flights delayed or cancelled. Residents caught in the flood have taken shelter in libraries, cinemas and museums. Schools and hospitals have also been cut off by waterlogging. That's news, but for the very latest, visit us at www.barbetastoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook. And sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. You can also hear us on Capital Media HD 99.3.